Hello and welcome to NARC Live on Wednesday the 31st of March 2021. Coming to you live from Norfolk on the east coast of England with Tammy M0TC. Hello. And me, David G7RP. It's great to see you. Thanks for joining us. On tonight's show, our getting to know guest is Peter Waters, G3 OJV of Waters and Stanton fame. Find out what's so special about this thrippany bit. And we find out who worked from a shack like this. Well, we had three entries by email, so it's not too late if you'd like to enter, if you think you know whose shack that was. I did give a clue in the newsletter. I said this shack would be good for a great home office. If you think you know whose that shack was, it was from the 1970s, then um, please drop your notes down now on either Facebook or on BATC with your name and your call sign and of course we'll read it out in a little while. But first we've got some club news and as you hopefully know by now the Norfolk Amateur Radio Club annual general meeting is on the 14th of April. That's straight after a mini NARC Live so for those of you who are not NARC members don't worry we'll still have one of these programs and we're planning a few things for that but that will be a shorter program than usual and our AGM will start just before 8 something like that on that night. But um, as uh, those of you who are NARC members will know, you'll have had an email um, talking about the AGM and the various things that you could vote on, sending specific questions or comments and also charity nominations. And thanks to, very much to all of you who responded and offered to propose our AGM documents and things like that. Now, some members, there were two members who nominated two charities for us to consider to adopt for fundraising. Obviously at this point in March we're not really sure what activities we'll be able to do through the year for fundraising but we're going to try and do some even if we have to do them remotely because I don't think any of us really know what's going to happen in terms of meetings and things later in the year but I'm sure that this imagination will, will mean that we can uh, raise some money at least for charities. So the two people that nominated I'm going to read out to you the details about those but don't worry don't vote now, don't vote on BATC or Facebook or anything because there's going to be a very special online voting form which I'll show you in a moment which you'll be able to link to with a special newsletter that will go out this weekend. So first we heard from John G0MXN. Now he nominates the East Anglians Children Hospice. He said it's a charity funded mainly by donations from parents and members of the public. It was established to provide terminal palliative care to dying children. The EACH also provides accommodation and support to parents and siblings of the very ill children in their care. The COVID-19 pandemic has hit them very badly in the past year, closing down most of the usual fundraising activities relied upon to pay for services to children and relatives. Our nearest hospice is the Nook at Framlingham Piggott and is therefore very local to the club, NARC. While John is aware that there are several charities NARC might wish to support, he believes that the East Anglian Children's Hospice is a worthy local charity in desperate need of funds, having lost much fundraising capability in the past year. In fact, he says the current operating deficit due to COVID-19 is about £2 million due to loss of fundraising events in the past year. So every penny raised is vitally important. So that's some details about the East Anglian Children's Hospice, sometimes known as EACH. And now I'm going to give you the details of the other nomination that we had for a charity for us to consider to support. And that was from John G8VPE and he suggests that we nominate, or he nominates rather, the Guide Dogs for the Blind Association. Uh, he says that he can't remember the club previously making any donations to this worthy cause. The dogs do have to be replaced all the time when they're forced to retire through old age or infirmity. And so here are some of the bullet points of the details of what money uh, that you donate to Guide Dogs of the Blind, where it goes to. So it provided almost 190,000 people with information about sight loss. Last, these are all things last year. Created 685 new Guide Dog partnerships and supported 4,800 partnerships in total. Matched with 1,296 people with a sighted guide. Helped 2,845 children learn essential life skills so that they can navigate the world around them confidently and safely. Made 4,000 tailor-made books enabling children with sight loss to enjoy reading just like their friends. 
Had 1,095 people affected by site loss attend other family events. Provided support for 9,650 times for children with a vision impairment and their families and partnered 52 children with a buddy dog, helping improve their confidence and well-being in 2020. Well, it's not for me to tell you, of course, who and how you should vote. Don't vote now, though. As I said, please don't vote on BATC or Facebook because that won't count. But we have generated a, a nice form that you'll be able to link to. We'll be sending that to you this weekend in the newsletter that's going out just to NARC members. And we ask only NARC members who are paid members to, to vote for this. Normally, this, this program is very inclusive and we love people watching from wherever you are in the world. But these are this, I hope you'll excuse the fact that these are, are club events. This is the sort of form that you'll be able to link to. We've got a few little details. I know that's not terrible terribly clear possibly for you at home at the moment, but that's the sort of thing. So it's going to be very, very simple. You just basically click on whichever one of the charities that you want to uh, vote on, enter your name and your call sign if you have one and your email address and then submit it. And there will be a link sent to everybody who's registered on the NARC newsletter um, mailing list. So thank you again to John G8VPE and John G0MXN for those nominations. And it will be your votes that count as they say for which charity that we will support this year in our fundraising efforts. Now, um, let's get back to my words here. And uh, we've been said a couple of things this week with Paul G3VPT has sent, hi, this one is for Tammy. He says, this is my threepenny bit. Threepenny. Threepenny. Thrip Thripenny, yeah. Thripenny. And do you know what? This is, shows you the age generation difference between us because I wrote down on the, we have a little, uh, as well as a script, we have a sort of running order which says which cameras to go to, which wide shot, close up and all that sort of thing. And I put 3D in the comma, Colin, and I didn't know if you'd know what 3D meant. Yeah, it's like you have virtual reality no. and stuff. No, and... it's not old enough. Isn't it lovely to be not old enough to know what that really means? <laughs> 3D used to be the name for three pence, and now it's right. P. So it went from D to P. Do you see what I mean? Anyway, let's have a look at it, Tammy. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> this, right. is the, this is the picture that uh, Paul sent us. He sent us two pictures. This is the front side, but he said it's about you. So do tell us. Well, no, I'm thinking he the sent comments. it because obviously we had the coins, didn't we? He did, and he yeah, said that the threepenny bit, and he says that the, the heads looks okay. But the tails, oh, hang on, that's not the that's right not button, us. is it? No. <laughs> tails looks like that. Mm. So I'm intrigued. So yeah. I'm thinking it's either, well, I'm thinking probably it might be a little sort of thing you can put like a, well, anything in, like a spy thing. Do you know what yeah. I mean? Well, I, yeah, I must admit when I saw it, my, I don't know why, but I instantly thought of magic because I think I've seen a coin trick like this somehow done, probably not with a threepenny bit, but with something like that, a hollowed out coin. Yeah. I don't even know if you're I allowed to the, do it. I wonder really, if there's cause... actually a lid for it. So if there is a um, actual tail side to it. Hmm. But I mean, it's quite old, isn't it? Because it's, um, it's got George the Sixth on it. So yeah. it's like 50s or something. Although know. it might I wasn't not around have, then, um, Tammy, to no. remember that. <laughs> it might not have, um, you know, it might have been made afterwards, but it's a fairly old coin, isn't it? Yes. Well, I honestly don't know. Dave, uh, Paul didn't say, rather, um, what it was about. So, Paul, if you know, and this was just a teaser for us, then maybe you could drop us a note and we'll tell you all next week what it is, if you have any idea, or where you got it from, even. That's very interesting. Yeah, that's very cool. Thank you for sending that. Now, Ken M0KJW sent us this email and said that Tammy would enjoy it. The first one is this. Shall I do it in the voice? Yeah, do it in the all voice. Right. I need your clothes. Your boots and your motorcycle. <laughs> that makes me think of you. <laughs> what does? Oh, yeah, I think oh, you mean Arnie being tough and. No, I think you look a bit like Wallace. <laughs> that did make me chuckle. Thank oh, you, come Ken. On. Surely you can give me a bit of credence here. <laughs> the muscular, hard type, no? What, Wallace? Yeah. <laughs> All right. Okay. Ken, thank you very much for sharing that with us. As we always say, please, please um, uh, send us your bits and pieces like that because they do add and lighten up the week for everybody. Thank you very much. Just send, email them to the usual place, radio at dcpmicro.com. This is the email address there. For anything for the show, we'd love to hear from you. So now we go on to Tammy's bit of the programme, which is just you. I'm no, Don't interfere or anything, do I? No. Nope. I don't even see it, and I haven't seen this week. 
Tammy's Little People is what we call it. Over to you. Okay, here's the little people this week. It's because we've had a nice few days of sunshine. I thought we'd go for um, some ice cream. <laughs> oh, wow. So this was called Strawberry Blossom. But I think probably maybe it's translated here probably as Cherry Blossom. Yeah, oh, yes, of course. Yeah, that's the right yeah. colour. In fact, I just commented, you know, we've got a neighbour who's got a lovely cherry blossom tree. Yeah. And the colours from it, it was just like that ice cream. There we Wonderful go. Wonderful stuff. Little people, if you want to see more of those, miniature-calendar.com. We show one of these every week, but in fact, there's a new one every day. I there think. is, yep. Thanks, Tammy, for that. So, as I said, please keep in touch with what you're doing. You know the usual address, radio at dcpmicro.com. We do love to hear from you. And if we don't use it that week, we'll certainly use it in, in forthcoming weeks. It's great to get your news. And now let's uh, have a look at this weekly shack that we have. We have just a few now. I keep saying this because at Christmas I remember thinking, have we got enough? This, this last week I've been sent two more. So it's brilliant. But if you have been waiting to send your shack and you haven't got around to it, you need to send them to us now, by the way, your shack pictures, because we'll be coming to the end of the competition. And once we do, once we come to the end of the shacks, so then we'll be starting something new. But anyway, let's have a look at this shack and ask when we last week we asked who worked from a shack like this. Did you know? Have we had any guesses? Um, well, I'm just looking online. I don't think we've had any guesses right now. Um, so we've just got the ones that we've had before the start of the saying show. Good evening. Yeah, we ought to give name checks to these people. I mean, I'm sure you can all see them, but we've got about uh, 50 people watching on Facebook and 40 odd people watching on BATC. So good evening to all of you anyway, thanks for joining us. Yep, I don't think there's any shack guesses on there. So we'll tell you about the ones that we had on uh, by email. Uh, Ken M0KJW says, I don't suppose that the shack could possibly belong to Steve G4GHO, question mark. David M7BLX says, I think it may be um, G3ZIG Roy's shack. And Colin M0 GMK says, from your clue, I guess it was the shack of Steve G4 GHO. So Tammy, press that button, reveal whose shack it was. It was Steve G4 GHO shack. So well done to Ken and Colin. Hard luck to David, but thank you all for entering. I know it's tough. I know if you don't have any clues, there was a, a lovely backstory to this um, from Steve, but basically this was a shack from his 1970s and he worked down there in Chelmsford Way. And look at that. And that, that little rig to the right of that, that's a crystal set that he made, but it had an amplifier and things like that. So it was a crystal set plus some. Brilliant stuff. Thanks cool. very much for sharing that, Steve. I must admit, he, you know, right back in the early days of this competition and uh, Narc Live about a year ago, he sent us a picture of his shack and it was just a handheld radio. I remember that. Oh, yeah. was, we, we thought, well, really, can we use that? Yeah. So it was nice that he brought us up to date, as it were, with, with well, the shack. I think we're going back in time. Well, we are going back, this. but you know what I mean. It's, it's, <laughs> it's brought the proper shack. So thanks very much for that. Now it's time to have a look at a brand new shack. This one, well, I think there are clues. There. There's about three clues on this. So tell us, who works from a shack like this? Club member, as always. There are some good clues there. I don't think I need to tell you. I mean, the Apple Macs there, that might even be a clue in itself, really. But I better not say any more. But there are some good clues there. Have a good look at it now. But as always, this will be up on our website in the next couple of days. Tammy will put it on Facebook as well tonight, probably. So the Facebook page will have it. And you have until 3 o'clock next Wednesday to send us an email to tell us who Shaq you think that is. At that could I'm not going to no I can't I can't resist what, what point out something no we mustn't no I think let's see how you get on without any clues and if you don't if we don't have any entries in the next couple of days before we send the newsletter out then maybe I'll do a clue or two but have a look at that there are plenty of clues believe me this person's well known to our club so thanks very much send the addresses send uh, your entries rather to the usual address radio at dcpmicro.com send them to us by three o'clock next wednesday and of course we'll include them and let you know who shack it is next wednesday night paul, now just to sorry, sorry uh, mm. i was just gonna say paul has actually just commented and said um sorry tammy i have no idea that's why i sent it to you <laughs> that oh. was the coin oh right yes okay oh yes yes we must we must have a look at this sorry 
Yeah, uh, we've got some comments and we ought to read them out now. Um, Steve, whose shack it was, by the way, G4GHO, said, I used to make rings out of coins by carefully hammering the edges to spread them and then, mm. and then turning out the centres. But isn't there some rule or law even about defacing the, crown, defacing the Queen's head? Yeah, but I don't think people really... Uh, no? You could go, go in the tower, you know. Well, I have, I have sawn through a pound <laughs> coin myself. <laughs> <laughs> Anyway. All right. Well, anyway, so Paul had no idea. If you have any idea of what that coin could have been used for, I mean, seriously, of course, it could have been some secret thing in well, from the war or something like I that, or maybe hiding a little. Yeah, somebody uh, else has said that they think it's magic. I think I saw. Did they? Oh, you get them from a joke a shop. A joke shop, Bob Fuller. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah. And let's go back to the. I know there's a comment at the end. Steve, whose shack it was, uh, he said actually the crystal set was powered entirely off air. And the single transistor and S meter were operated from the rectified signal from Crobra World Service Transmitter. Oh, and he lived in Crawley then. I beg your pardon, Steve. I was doing that all from memory. Okay, brilliant. So uh, you wouldn't think there'd be enough power coming out of a crystal set to power anything active like a transistor to even get over the sort of voltage drop and everything else like that. Uh, maybe I'm guessing that he might have been quite close to this uh, World Service Transmitter, so they had a lot of power there. Anyway, thank you very much for your shack again, Steve, for entering that. Um, let's now um, let uh, you know what's happening next week on the on the club activities. So on uh, Sunday at seven o'clock, it's uh, GB two RS, which is the RSGB's news service uh, on uh, GB three MB. On Monday night, fifth of April, Monday night net um, is with Steve G three EVA, and at half past eight. It's the 80 meter CW net, that's on Monday. And next Wednesday here, on the 7th of April, Grounding and Bonding by Tim Duffy K3LR. Now, Tim has been a guest with us before, although that was, the I think, the last time we had him, when we were probably meeting at the club at the time, and he came to us by mm. Skype. But uh, you may know he runs a big company over in the States called DX Engineering, but he is definitely a really enthusiastic amateur as well. And he'll be talking to us about grounding and bonding, which sounds boring, but in, if you've re relatively recently came into this hobby, you will you'll get to know that this is a really important part of any hobby. And although it's the, the aerial and the rig and everything that looks the sexy bits of it, actually the grounding and bonding can, can really help your performance as well. So, and Tim, of course, will be live here, so you'll be able to ask him questions as well. So that's next week here on NARC Live. And all the regular stories, your shack, uh, or, or uh, whose shack rather, and uh, your stories, of course, and details to the usual address, radio at dcpmicro.com. And as I always say at this time as well, we are very happy to send this card to anybody. We sent one to someone who just came out of hospital, that was Julie. I won't name, but don't go any further than that, but uh, Julie has just come out of hospital and recovery, but watched the show every week, and her husband asked us to send this card. So we're very happy to send a card like this to anybody at all you think would be cheered up from a card from Norfolk Amateur Radio Club. There we are. And just drop us a line with their name and address and your details, and we'll add your name to ours and send it to them. Now it's time for our, our main event. And we every month we have a a feature called Getting to Know, where we get to know someone a little bit better who's been into the, in the uh, amateur radio community. And our guest tonight is the Waters in the very well-known amateur radio retailer Waters and Stanton. But as we'll learn tonight, Peter Waters isn't just a businessman, but a genuine, long-term, enthusiastic radio amateur. So it's really wonderful to welcome Peter from his home in Hockley in Essex. Good evening to Peter. Good evening and uh, welcome to Hockley Essex and uh, thanks for the introduction. Yes, uh, I have been around for quite a few years actually, so it is very much long term, both business and of course the hobby. Um, we're really looking forward to hearing about everything about your life and I know you're not just a radio amateur, you're a keen musician and everything as well and we're going to learn all about that aren't we Peter, but maybe can we start by just finding out how you first got involved with amateur radio? Okay, well, it's a strange introduction when I say that it all started with making model aeroplanes. I was quite keen at the age of 12 and 13 in flying model aircraft, and I decided to build a radio-controlled glider. And I was fascinated that with this little radio, and it was very basic, I could actually move the rudder on the aeroplane, and there was no connection. And that was my first introduction in radio. 
a little while later, I say a while later, I think I was about 15 at the time, I went into a news agent uh, locally to me uh, when I was living in Hornchurch, and I came across a magazine called Shortwave Magazine. And I thought, Shortwave, that's radio. So I looked at this magazine, had a quick flick through it, and I thought, gosh, I, I saw a picture of a, a guy operating a radio station. I thought, what fun it would be to have your own radio station. So I bought this copy of Shortwave Magazine and took it home and read it from cover to cover. And that really was how I first became really aware uh, that amateur radio existed. Sad today, of course, that there's not really a magazine in every bookstall covering amateur radio. But that's that's really my introduction mm. to radio. We've got a picture of a book here that you sent us, Pierre. I don't know if this where this quite fits in those early days, but we'll just show you this picture now. So is this the Radio Constructor? No, that was that's an RSGB publication. Um, and you, as you can see, I was a bit younger then. It was actually taken in 19... Oh, that's you on the front. I didn't know that. I'm that's sorry. on the front cover, yes. Right, OK. Yes, well, uh, yes. well there you are. You see, I've aged so much, you don't recognise me. <laughs> <laughs> but that was taken in 1960. That was actually just before I was licensed. That was a, a station set up. It was actually I, the, the club I belonged to in Romford. Um, one of the guys there was G2B, VN Roy Stevens, who subsequently became a president of the RSGB. And he asked me if I would go and pose in this picture for the uh, um, for the cover of this uh, this book. So th th this was a, a an early guide um, to amateur radio. So, th so this was this something like Radcom in the early days, or was this just a, a guide for anybody getting started with amateur radio? Then uh, this was this was a publication actually by the RSGB. The RSGB even in those days were publishing books. Right. So this was this was this was a, a one-off, a guide to amateur radio. It was a one-off book. I think it was published several more times after that. But uh, yeah, that was one of the RSGB publications. To you know, it, basically it was quite technical. Actually, it was quite useful to read. It was it was quite a useful magazine to read if you were studying for the City and Guilds exam. Yeah, absolutely. It's brilliant. Um, by the way, we've got a couple of comments coming already. Um, P uh, Dave, G8ADM, says, hello, Peter. Uh, Shortwave magazine was great, he said. Um, and I should remind everybody at home now watching this that you can ask Peter a question either during his talk uh, or his interview uh, or right at the end if you wish. Um, and we'll, we'll certainly um, ask Peter and bring, take that question to him. Um, so back to you, Peter. What was the next step then? So you, you, you took this radio constructor and you, you, I guess, that that inspired you to have a go at amateur radio. Yeah, yeah. I, I decided I wanted to become a radio amateur. Um, but at that particular time, I left school at 16 and I started work in London. Um, and on my journey up to uh, Liverpool Street, uh, I used to uh, avidly read uh, technical books about radio. I knew what the City and Guild's um, syllabus was, so I was avidly trying to cover um, this. I didn't have any sort of formal tuition at all. I just read it uh, on the train there and back, and of course, a lot at home. And uh, that really was was how I started. And the City and Guild's exam then was a two two part exam. I think the first part was technical, and you had to write, you had to draw a circuit diagram of an oscillator and this sort of thing. And the second part, I think, was license regulations. But it was it was all a a sort of handwritten exam there was no um, question and answer situation in those days no I mean it's, it's probably quite relevant to, to remind everybody at home especially to those who have recently become M6s and M7s that um, now we have this three level of, of uh, exam entry but in those days there was just one wasn't there and it was a really like effectively like taking the full I guess but but not not multiple answers not multiple questions and things as well, Peter. That's what you're saying, isn't it? It was much tougher, in other words, to get into and to get your license for amateur radio. Yeah, I suppose in, in a way it was tougher. Of course, radio in those days was still being developed. So uh, it was a lot of it was a bit more basic than what it would have been now. Uh, it was vel how valves operate, how an oscillator operates. Uh, you have to draw a block diagram of a, of a transmitter and this sort of thing. But it was, it was I mean, it was te technical enough to... Uh, to um, warrant a city and guild exam, um, but th that was you know that was that was what you had to do. So you had to do it. Mm, brilliant. So what was next then? When did you finally get your shack? What, what do you remember when you were licensed? Yes, I can. Um, I previously built a two valve regenerative receiver, which uh, I found subsequently covered forty meters. I heard radio amateurs. I had no idea where they were, but uh, I found later it was the forty meter amateur radio band. 
Um, I passed the uh, exam at the first sit-in, and then, of course, I had to do the CW, the Morse code. And again, I was self-taught. I used to listen to Morse code on the air, and there was practice transmissions locally by local amateurs. And I, went, I was working in London then. It's quite easy because I then uh, went to post office, as it was then, to take the uh, CW examination, 12 words a minute, passed that, got, me, got my little um, bit of paper saying I passed the CW exam. And then I applied for my licence and the application for my licence was on foot. I went down to the local post office headquarters in London. Um, I went into some room there, which I had to go to to, to apply for my licence. A lady bought um, an exercise book to the counter, all handwritten, and she said, you can have any one of those call signs on that page. Wow. I have no idea why I chose G3OJV, but I did. And that was how I got my call sign. I just went in there and it was in, in a textbook, uh, an exercise book rather handwritten and uh, that was it g3ojv came home i'd already built a, a transmitter it was a 6v6 uh, pa uh, amplifier which is around about five or six watts i think um and there was an audio amplifier fed with a with a carbon microphone very very crude um crystal controlled but that was the way it was in those days it was crystal controlled on 1.981 um megahertz i think and uh, that was a popular frequency because I think there was a plentiful supply of crystals of that frequency. Many, a lot of us will already know that you, know, you eventually ended up running a shop. But so can we ask, though, in those days, you said you worked in London. What were you doing? What was your career in the early days? Right. Well, I, 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 was, I was in the insurance industry. I, 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 I trained as a fire insurance surveyor um, and I was, I was working in uh, insurance until I was 30. And my patch was basically London um, and uh, parts of Essex. And my job really was to go around um, to look at the buildings, uh, to assess them from a fire risk point of view, um, check fire extinguishers, check um, the workings of sprinklers, because a lot of buildings had sprinklers, make sure they were operating OK. Came back, did drawings of the buildings, um, and that was then passed to the insurance underwriters who would then... Uh, calculate a, uh, a premium. Uh, this is all commercial, of course. Uh, calculate mm. a premium for the risk. So nothing and, uh, to do with retail or anything like that in those days. Sorry, I nothing. Sorry, I'm sorry. Nothing to do with retail or anything in because we a lot of us know that you ran a shop <laughs> later on, but no, there was nothing to do with retail at all. No, no, nothing to do with retail at all. I, I, I always wanted my own business. And actually, I started while I was still working in, in insurance. I was very um, keen on Amish Radio, of course. And um, I was involved with the RSGB. I think it was the EMC committee, or whatever it was called in those days. And, and that they, were, um, they, were, they were pushing the idea of ferret rings on everything, ferret rings on, on lease to TVs and, and audio systems. And so I decided that what I would do is I'd find a source of ferrite rings and sell them, and I did. And then I came across something called Minibeam in America. And uh, I got in touch with them, and I said, look, uh, I'd like to bring these, these aerials into the UK. And they said, OK. And my bedroom uh, became the storeroom. And that went on for about a year. And I suddenly thought, wait a minute, I'm, I really want to get into radio. So that was the turning point. Um, it was a big decision because I had two young girls, um, two and four years old. I had a mortgage. Um, looking back on it, I wouldn't do it again now, certainly. <laughs> but at those days, you're younger and you take risks. And that's what I did. I gave up the job in London and opened up a small lockup shop in, uh, in Hockley. And, uh, the reason that um, Jeff was involved, he was also working in the same insurance company as I was, and he was keen on hi-fi, and we thought, well, he's keen on hi-fi, I'm keen on radio, perhaps we could open a shop that sells hi-fi and amateur radio, which is what we did. So, and roughly when was this? What sort of time? I'm, I'm apologising. It's, it's a very year that's very easy to remember. It was 1973, would you believe? 1973. We've got a picture here. I know is of the shop. Can we show that right now? Yes, you can. That's that sh that picture was taken uh, around about nineteen. Uh, that would have been about nineteen seventy six, seventy eight, and uh, that probably was our entire stock. <laughs> so I mean, I remember going down to the shop, 
Um, and and it, it, about half of it at the time when, when I first went down, at least there was TVs and hi-fis and things. And then the other half roughly was amateur radio. Did it stay a sort of balancing act like that for a while? Well, actually, when it first started, it was very predominantly hi-fi because, you know, we had great difficulty in getting supplies of amateur radio equipment. Um, the Bill Lowe, who some of you may remember, or remember the name anyway, Lowe Electronics, they would not supply us. They saw us as a competitor and they said, they're not going to supply you. Uh, SMC in Southampton were also reluctant to supply us. And I think in the early days, we got some equipment through Harry Leem in G3LLL. But eventually, we sort of managed to persuade SMC to supply us. Bill Lowe was very difficult. He just didn't want to supply us at all. And we had to wait, I don't know, about six or seven years before we got to um, uh, Lowe Electronics, who then were the Kenwood um, distributors. They'd, they'd given up the ASU and they were selling um, uh, Kenwood gear, which at that time was very, very popular. It, it, was, it was one of the market leaders far ahead of Icon. Icon, Icon came up from the, the rear um, in those days, there was a there was a quite a small manufacturing operation icon. Mm. I mean, at that time, I guess, and you mentioned, I remember Low Electronics, but I guess there were several other retailers in this industry at that time. Yeah, there were. Um, I'm trying to think. Uh, Low Lowe's were the biggest. Uh, well, I so, say so Lowe's and SMC were the biggest. Um, there was Stephen James, uh, Burkett. Um, I, I, the other names that come to come to come to mm -hmm. mind. Um, a, a lot of the a lot of the dealers were uh, in the early days. They were still selling war surplus equipment. You know, I mean, mm -hmm. I, I spent many happy hours in Tottenham Court Road mm -hmm. and Edgware Road and uh, Parade Street, um, and uh, all the shops were set in, in, in. This is before I got into amateur radio uh, retailing, and and. And even in the even when we started, there was still um, equipment that was war surplus being sold. So uh, there was a, there was there was uh, there was scope for a lot of dealers. And of course, in those days, there were manufacturers as well. There was microwave modules. Mm -hmm. um, I'm trying to think, of one of the other firms. There were one or two small manufacturers that were quite doing quite well. Unfortunately, um, it, it, you know they can't survive now. But in those days, they were, they were able to survive. And I guess that, I mean, there wasn't the internet then clearly, although there was mail order. So were most of your customers local people to Hockley and Essex or, or did you advertise in some of these magazines um, and start doing mail order of radios as well? We started advertising, I started advertising in Radcom in 1972, the year before I actually opened the oh, shop. So yeah. I was actually working in insurance and had an advert in Radcom. In oh, what, what, so, so Peter, what were you selling then if you, if you hadn't even opened the shop? Well, I was selling. It was, I was selling ferret rings. I was selling the mini beams we got from America, because I had those about a year before we started the shop, and one of the other bits and pieces. It was, you know, it was. I was eager to sell anything to start, get the business started. Mm. My plan was really to get the business started from home and then migrate uh, to it full time. It was. It wasn't easy. Um, yes, we 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 we, sell, we, sell, we there was mail order certainly. Um, but uh, I think, uh, I mean, Hockley, Hockley is not, not the centre of the universe by any means. It's a village. Um, but, yeah, we got people coming all sorts, you know, quite, quite a long distance. But also we did sell quite a lot of mail order then. Because, you see, the, what, there was, even in those days, you know, the, the amateur radio, whoops, hit the microphone. The amateur radio shop was probably 50 or 100 miles away for a lot of people. So yes. they had no choice, really. They could make the trip, of course, but I think a lot of it was, was sent. And we, we used to um, put uh, goods on the train. I, I, it was, the Red, I think, Red Star. Oh, yeah, like Red that. Star. I remember that, yeah. Yeah, yeah so we used a... to go, because Hockley Railway Station was just around the corner. So we used to take um, our parcels down to the railway station and uh, go, they used to go on the train. <laughs> yeah, one of our members, Chris Danby, is someone I know you'll know, and he mentioned another couple of manufacturers, Heathkit and KW. Oh yes, KW Electronics. Yes, um, they, they were. They were. The, they they their transceiver was a copy of the Collins, and Roly Shears was very successful. Um, in fact, um, he introduced the first, I think it was the first SSB transceiver uh, or transmitter in the UK, and. Um, I had one of his transceivers, the KW KW two thousand B, but yeah, I mean he was he was a real pioneer. 
and the KW equipment was very popular. It's it's still being used today, and I think they have a KW day um, each year. I think it's I think it was in February, um, when or KW weekend when all the owners of KW equipment go on the air and work each other. But yeah, good good gear that was. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and we've talked a, um, of a lot, a bit about your retail career as well. And I mean, we're going to ask that question later on. I did warn you that we already have been asked it by email. So we're going to ask you why it moved. But maybe we'll say that to a little bit later as you tell us your story. But one of the other sli- uh, pictures that you've sent us is, is not a picture uh, of something that we'd associate with you. Can we show that now, actually, Tammy, to put you on the spot? Um, this is a picture of you, not with no radio in there, but you're playing the drums. So what is it? Love of music. Well, that was that's always been my other interest, music. Um, I I actually my my, the, my main instrument was violin. I used to play the violin um, as a kid at school, and then I got a scholarship and I studied music at Trinity College, uh, uh, London, until I was eighteen. And I studied the violin and also piano. I didn't like the piano really, um, but I played the violin subsequently um, in a number of amateur orchestras. I was in the uh, Essex Youth Orchestra. Um, which is a classic sort of symphony orchestra type thing up to the age of about 20, I think. Um, but I, I, it, I was never a sort of professional standard, but I, I, did, I did enjoy it. And I, play, I carried on playing. I played in um, the pits of several um, theatres in Hornchurch when they had operas there and that sort of thing. Um, but then in later times, I started to develop an, an eye problem. It's, it's, it's just been a problem for the whole of my life, really, since the age of 18. And I've been a life member of Moorfields Eye Hospital. I think I've been going to Moorfields for about 60 years now. Wow. Um, and I eventually gave up the violin because I just couldn't read the music. I had a, a particular um, eye problem where there's a little bit missing. And I, therefore, I couldn't read music. And I really gave it up. And then about 15 years ago, um, I remarried. And Sue, my uh, my wife, is a very good keyboard player. And I said, I wish I could join in. And she said, what about drums? And I thought, gosh, I don't know. I've never tried, tried playing drums. So I got in touch with a local drum teacher who happened to be a professional jazz drummer. And um, that's how I took up drums. And I, I play drums as and when I get the opportunity. Um, and the and the Graham, my music teacher, has become a sort of a, a lifelong friend now because we've got, both got another interest, which is aircraft. But that's another story. I won't bore you with aircraft. <laughs> no, well, that's all right. It's lovely to get to know you. Um, we've got another picture here. I don't want to. I, I hope we're, we, we're we're playing these about the right amount. We've got another picture here. Um, of this is a, a aircraft being handed over. I mean, do you want to talk about that at this point? Yes. Yeah, sure. Yes. Um, I, I have been going to Dayton in the States, the, the Hamvention there for years. I think I must have made about, I think I must have gone there for 25 uh, trips without, without a break. And of course the break occurred with COVID a couple of years ago now, or a year or so ago. Um, but I've always uh, been quite friendly with um, Eric Schwartz, who's there on the right. And I'd always say to him, look, we, we, we really would, could do with Ellicraft. And he said, well, you know, yes, one day, but there's not the margin. They're not the margin there. Anyway, I eventually pinned him down about 15 years ago. And I said, look, Eric. And he said, OK, Peter, yeah, look, why don't we do something together? And um, he, he, said, I, you know, he said, I know you. He said, I know about the company. He said, you don't tell me about yourself. He said, I know. I've seen you at dates and we have a chat every year. So he said, yes. He said, let's give it a go. And um, I think that photograph must have been taken about eight years ago when the KX2 was introduced. And that was that KX2 was one of the first ones off the production line because they launched it in Dayton. And Eric's on the right there. And on the left is Wayne, um, who is the sort of co-founder of, uh, of Edicraft, Wayne and Eric. And that's me with the um, KX2, which I've still got. One of the first KX2s, I think it was number 003, something like that. Hmm. And is this, I mean, you are still a major dealer of Ellicraft, aren't you? Yes. Um, I mean, Ellicraft, I always regard, I always think Ellicraft is rather the sports car of the uh, the ham radio business. Um, technically, it's very good. It, the performance is very good. It's always near the top of the, um, um, I can't remember the chart now. Um, uh, I know you uh, mean, and I've, I've just forgotten the name. Sherwood. Sherwood. Well done. Rob Sherwood. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway, it's all—it's always at the top there, um, but 
it lacks the finish of the Japanese equipment because the Japanese obviously spend a lot of money in finishing their gear, but Ellicraft concentrates on the inside. So I always say it's like a sports car. It may not look pretty, particularly pretty on the outside, but it's great on the inside. And they've had some very, very good transceivers, but recently they've had a bit of a problem because they stopped the production of the K3 mm. series, which had been running for about more well, 15 years. Um, the K4 was announced, but that coincided with COVID. It coincided with serious fires in California, where one of the engineers uh, lost his home. And it's also, as, uh, as a result of COVID, component supplies have been very difficult. So the K4, although it's been produced now in small quantities, it's not at the level where they can supply Europe because it has to go for CE tests. And you can only su submit a product for CE tests if it's a production model, and at the moment that production level is not high enough to submit it for CE testing. So we're still waiting for the K4. Oh, that, and that that, is, that's rather sad, really, because Helicraft have been hit by supplies and, as I say, the COVID situation and so forth. Yeah. But um, it'll come. Yeah, I, I did wonder, and I'm sure many people watching, I know that we have a lot of uh, members of the club who are very keen on Helicraft equipment. And um, I, I wonder why the K4 hadn't come out yet. And I'd heard about the fire in one of the production facilities, but I hadn't heard about this, the CE marking and that that's what's prevented them because they haven't been able to get the volume through. Let's hope that that sorts itself out soon. Yes, I mean, uh, even though we're not in the EU now, we are still going to um, uh, go along with the uh, CE certification. And uh, until it's got that, of course, we can't, we can't import it. So we have to sit and wait, I'm afraid. Mm. We've just got a few comments. I'm going to try and keep on some, some of the questions and comments for you, if that's all right. Um, Victor G3JNB says, Hi, Peter. I've just taken my copy of A Guide to Amateur Radio from the bookcase. He says, it was given to me in 1950 and it gave me the lead into the hobby. So there we are. You, your picture on the front, little did you know maybe at the time, but you've inspired people who are now watching you and hearing about your life story now. <laughs> <laughs> that, that it has been published it has been published and republished so um my picture is not on the front of all copies um i'm not sure which copy he's got there but um I, it was subsequently published with somebody else on i i think uh, i think after about five years i was no longer young enough to go on the front oh, cover Pete, oh, oh, there we are I'm sure they are. I, I relate to that. All right. Um, we've got Rodney G0CBO um, has sent us a message. Back in the 70s, I lived in Kent and remember Icon being sold by Thanet Electronics in a village somewhere near Hearn Bay. The, the yeah. shop was run by Dave Stockley, who is now Silent Key, he says. Um, no, that's not true. Oh, um, Dave okay. Stockley is not a Silent Key. Oh, well, At I'm... least he was, uh, he was on the air two, two days ago. Oh, goodness um, me. The, okay. the other partner, whose name I can't remember now, did die some while ago. But Dave Stockley, no, he's very much alive, very much alive. Why? Oh. His, uh, his son uh, now runs the, the show, but Dave is still, is, is, uh, still active. Um, and he's, I heard him on 160 metres two days ago. So um, one of them did die, but it wasn't Dave. All it was right, the well, other one. Thank you ever so much <laughs> for putting us right on that. And I'm sure Ronnie's watching, so he'll know that from now. Um, he said, uh, John Burkett, uh, sorry, this is Graham G8NWC says, John Burkett and Jack Tweedy G3ZY uh, this way in South Lincolnshire, he said. I think, yeah, because Graham lives in sort of Lincoln area. So, yeah, that was a, they were uh, Burkitts, I remember. Yes, I mean, were, in yes, fact, Burkitts, Burkitt, yeah. are they still yeah. going? I think, do they, do I see uh, them advertise? No, no, they were even older than me. <laughs> <laughs> oh, come on. <laughs> um, <laughs> And this is, uh, Graham's actually just said that was from the early 70s. Um, what else? Oh, yeah, Telford Communications. Nigel Gunn has said Telford Communications. Do you remember that? Yes. Yes. Yeah. 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 <clears throat> and it's, it's rather sad, isn't it, that, that all those companies were able to survive manufacturing. Um, I suppose because we didn't have, ICOM hadn't really got a foot in the market at all then. Um, Yesu had the FT. Uh, 101 um, and Kenwood were just starting up but uh, but those smaller companies were able to supply a lot of the smaller bits and, and it was Coda, Coda equipment as well mm. um, uh, they, they were making 160 meter transmitter and a separate receiver and so forth so it's, in those days there were quite a few small companies they weren't large companies but they were they were very active and you saw them at all the rallies but so eventually though you became quite a force in this and 
even now, you know, obviously you are a big force. Uh, without <clears throat> being unprofessional, I know you wouldn't be, but talking about some of your rivals, like Martin Lynch and Sons, for example, I mean, are these people that you sort of socialise with? And do you, do you talk between you? You're in a similar market. Um, we've got uh, Moonraker oh, yeah. and yeah, Nevada. So you, you, <laughs> yes, you can't, you, 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 you can't help avoiding them, really, and not that you want to avoid them, because um, until recently, we used to have the, uh, the amateur radio shows and the, and the bigger rallies, um, and so we, we used to bump into them. And of course, we, we trade with each other because almost every dealer, um, certainly every dealer of any size, um, uh, had their own products they bought in. And we say, look, can we have some of those? And you can have some of this and some of that. So, yeah, I mean, it was it, it, it's a hobby. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, occasionally there was a few rough edges that occurred. It wouldn't be, wouldn't be right to say there weren't some rough edges. <laughs> Mm. Uh, there's been one, one or two incidents, but it's nothing major. We still talk to each other and nobody has uh, suffered any injury so far, as far as I know. No, good, of course not. Um, your brand, one of your brands at least, is Watson. And it's, uh, that's a name that's on lots of power supplies and antennas and things like that. How did you go about starting to bring equipment in and getting equipment made for you? Presumably a lot of it made abroad eventually anyway. Yes, it was it was it was made abroad. Um, it was my decision really to do it. Um, we, we tried to create a brand because in going back when when the uh, Watson name was was uh, dreamt up and I, it was I dreamt it up one evening. It was a combination of Waters and Stanton, uh, W A T, and then a bit of Stanton. Mate, we came came up with Watson. Um, but it was really um, intended to we could bring products in that had names which weren't recognizable there were some some of the chinese chinese stuff have got some weird names um so we did, decided to bring it in under the watson brand and we tried to we, we we really branded up a range of products really products that um um had their own manufacturers but uh, none of the manufacturers really were, were household names we thought well if we brand it it becomes a name that is more more synonymous it has some sort of you know sort of flow to it so watson is a combination of waters and stanton and um, uh, everything, I think almost, well, one of, no, one or two products were made in the UK, um, but we, we branded up these smaller, uh, you know, companies' uh, products so that so they had a sort of a common name, you know, identif mm. identification, really. And you supply those, I guess, as you say, you do trade with other fellow competitors in the market and you supply, we do see Watson products being sold by other retailers. Yeah, and we we I mean we we also supply it um, to uh, to the US market as well. So yes, it's a uh, it's a brand that so uh, we've had for a long long time, uh, and it, it 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 works. You know, it's 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 really a way of bringing together a whole load load of products rather than having sort of you know this name and that name and some of them some of the Chinese names of course are difficult to pronounce. You you mm -hmm. think well wait a minute how do I pronounce that? So that was one of the reasons. But we wanted to t sort of create a brand of, of products which. We, I think we did. <laughs> yeah, you have. And you've given it credibility, I guess. You've got the support then and people know that they can come back to you if there's any problem or they've got a query or whatever with the equipment. Yeah. Well, Peter, yeah, we've, we've yeah, been talking now for just over half an hour and I think I've now got to ask you that question as we're still talking about retailing in the shop. Why did Waters and Stanton move down to Portsmouth? Right, OK. Well... First of all, we've been in Hockley for 45 years. I, 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 many people have said, oh, it's a shame you've gone because you were our local shop. Why did you have to go? Well, I think we, we, we worked, we served Hockley for 45 years. So I think we can't be um, accused of a sort of, a, a sort of you know, fly-by-night company in Hockley. Um, why do we move? Well, you see, a number of reasons. First of all, um, we needed to vacate the building because that building um, was primarily classed as a shop. And in recent times, shops uh, become expensive because the council rates you pay on a shop are much higher than if you were in a warehouse. So we were paying quite a high um, uh, rate for the shop. And the, the footfall in that shop was getting smaller and smaller because more and more people were buying on the internet. So we were we we were disadvantaged really, having to pay quite a hefty council tax because we were a shop, and yet that shop really was nothing like Tesco's or anything like that. There was there wasn't the flow of people. Um, 
Also, the building was scheduled to be developed, so that was another reason for moving. Um, Jeff wanted to really leave leave the business. He he'd had enough. I mean, I I'm 78 now. At the time, I was what 75 or something like that. Um, and Jeff Jeff was a couple of years younger, but he really wanted to get out. That meant to say that I was at my age. I was faced with a choice. I've got to find a new location. I've got to set up a company in this new location. And I'm coming to the age where I've done it once, I've done it twice, I've done it three times. We had four shops all, all, all in different locations in Hockley. I didn't really face the, I wanted to face that, that move on my own. And it was, I, I, I looked around and I couldn't really find anything locally. And then I had, I mean, I've known Mike for many years, G3SED Nevada. And we've been arch rivals. I mean, you know, we, 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 we're competitors, but we are both of the age where we can look at each other in the face and say, look, we've done it. We've got the T-shirt. We've proved, we've got nothing to prove. And Mike said to me, Peter, he said, um, I've just sold my music business. Mike had a very big music business in, in, in Portsmouth. And he said, I've sold the business. He said, I've got rid of one of my warehouses. He said, I've got some, uh, some surplus staff. And it wasn't an invitation so much as when we were talking, I thought, wait a minute. He's got space in a warehouse. He's got staff that know amateur radio. And we know that the business of retailing is predominantly becoming a mail order business. And of course, at the time, we had no idea that COVID was just around the corner and that shops wouldn't be allowed to open anyway. Mm. So a lot of talking with Mike, we, I decided that it was my best option. I could move the business to Portsmouth um, it would be, uh, it would take up uh, the staff that were there, the surplus staff that would be new, selling music, but also amateur radio. They were familiar with amateur radio, so that wouldn't be a problem. Um, and it would save me having to reorganise um, a, a new warehouse all on my own. And really and truly, um, although there wasn't, uh, obviously we didn't know about COVID at the time, looking back on it now, it was, it was a good move because the shop would have been closed anyway. Um, and retailing now has gone through a massive change, as you know. Uh, the, I, I am sorry that we're not in Essex because it would have been nice, but really and truly, it, was, it seemed to be the best option at the time. And looking back on it, although I know amateurs have lost us in Essex, the fact is that the majority of retail sales are now, and even then we're beginning to be uh, mail order. Mm. And of course, these days... You can very often order a product um, one day and be assured you're going to get it the following day. And if you don't like the colour of it, 10 days later, you send it back. Uh, you haven't got any petrol to, or any diesel or whatever, or electric, electric cars to, 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 to run. And it's, it's such a fast sort of business. The only thing you lose is the ability to try the equipment out. And I, I, you know, hands up, I understand that. But there again, it's been like that for most of the, the year that's just gone. So that, in a nutshell, is the reason we moved. So I, mean, many, I don't many, know if that answers the question. I don't, <laughs> no, it's, it's lovely, and I thank you for being so candid. I mean, I'm sure that I'm not the only one. I know I'm not the only one because we had several emails and people comment last week that they wanted to know, you know, why. I don't think, if I can be personal, I don't know you very well at all, but if I could say, I mean, for many people, when you get to your age, 78, they just think, well, why would you even want to carry on in business you know it's quite a very respectable age to sort of retire and hang up your microphone and just have it as a hobby but there's obviously something in you that wants to to carry on well you see i, th I suppose because it's a hobby um and i i mean i have got to the point now where um i'm not standing at the counter um waiting for the customer or sorting the customers out and I'm not I'm not there on the on the end of the end of the telephone particularly at the moment um I think if you if you enjoy what you're doing if you enjoy what you're doing and it's your hobby and I was going to say I've got nothing else to do <laughs> is your wife listening <laughs> she'll she'll find something I, I think all I can say, all I can say is I, I all I can say is I do enjoy it yeah um and at the level that I'm operating now um, I, I'm, I, I'm quite, I'm quite happy. Um, and f funny enough, Mike is in a similar situation. He says, Peter, he says, I, you know, he said, I think sometimes I should sell the business. He said, but 
I really enjoy what I'm doing, and I can I can identify with that. Yeah, I so, think I, yeah, it, absolutely. And I, I really, as I said, I really appreciate and respect the fact you're being so honest and candid because a lot of people do wonder. So before we leave the subject completely, but can I just ask one other thing? Because I have, I, I'm at a disadvantage because I, I went to your shop many times in Hockley, but I haven't been down to Portsmouth. But when we look at the adverts, you have a Nevada advert in Radcom and you have a, uh, you have a Waters and Stanton advert. Is the is the inventory shared? I mean, what is what is the relationship? If if I if I phone up, am I going to speak to somebody who? Uh, if I phone up the Nevada number, am I definitely going to be buying from Nevada? And if I phone up Waters and Stanton number, am I buying from you? Or is it more of a, a collaborative sort of cooperative joined arrangement? Do you share inventory and things? We certainly share the inventory. That's for, that's for sure. It would be stupid if we didn't. Um, we still operate as separate companies. The reason we operate as separate companies is because. We each have our own customer base, and being perfectly honest, if we were to merge, we feel that we would lose. We would each lose a bit of our customer base. But we also have brands. I mean, we 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 import Ellicraft, we import MFJ, we import AOR, which is a very key brand. It may not be so so well known in the amateur radio market, but commercially, it's a very um, a valuable brand. We also um, handle a range of um, the sort of metal cases which we sell to uh, government departments it's where, uh, and police departments that they, that where they can grab a mobile phone and they can put it into this, this metal cage and uh, you can put gloves in. That's like armoured gloves and you can manipulate the phone, but it stops people clearing the phone. So, I mean, this wow. is a product which we sell quite a few, but of course you wouldn't know anything about it. But no, no. We, we share resources, we, we share stock, we share um, the cost of running the, the warehouse. Um, on the sales side, generally speaking, those that answer the WNS line are WNS orientated, but they will cross over sometimes, you know, mm. the, if the Nevada phone's going mad and ours isn't, they'll cross over. But um, we just ran the two companies because we're so well known as individual companies. We thought at this stage, it, it, there's nothing to be gained and there's something to be lost by merging. So we, we run separately, work under, we, we under the same, work under the same roof. If you haven't been down to Portsmouth, uh, when things get a bit better, it's worth a trip because it's quite an easy trip. Um, it, we, the, the, the Portsmouth warehouse is just off the motorway and it's massive. It is massive. <laughs> and of course, there's no, par no parking probably just park straight outside because it's on an industrial estate. But uh, it's very easy to get to. So that's, that's basically why we did yeah. that. It's lovely. Thank you for sharing all of that with us. Uh, just a couple of comments for you. Um, Ken uh, M0KJW. Um, says where were we? we've got quite a few messages so they're, they're moving quickly I was sad that they moved from Hockley I have fond memories of going there but I didn't go as often as I would have liked I'm just glad that they're still trading and when I can I will call in at Portsmouth when he gets the chance he says so um, and uh, and he says by the way Ken also says I, I came to your shop and you all made us welcome as well so that's good. Uh, Peter and Jeff came to my shop in Norwich. Now, this is from Paul Gunther, so you probably know Paul. Um, he said, Peter and Jeff came to my shop in Norwich during the early 90s and they supplied me with equipment. Right. Good. I guess well, you... I mean, I, I, I've, uh, I, I had quite an association, I had quite an association with, with Norfolk um, and Norwich in particular, because um, I've had, because of my eye problem, I've had three um, corneal transplants. Um, one of the, the, the one was done in Norfolk, and as a result of that, I was uh, under a consultant um, at the Norfolk Norwich Hospital for many years, and I used to go up to Norwich about once every six months. So I know the A140. Mm. So I do mm. know Norwich quite well. Um, that's my only connection. But I had I have this visited Norwich, I think twice a year for many years. Yes, I mean, some, several people are mentioning a, a famous retailer called Donny Hobbs, who was in St. Benedict Street in Norwich. You may well have visited his shop. Oh, right, yes, 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 yeah, yeah. Hobbs yes. Electronics. Yeah. I can remember as a boy yes. going there and picking, yes. buying electronic yes. components and things like that as well. And there was um, another one in Lincolnshire um, who was still going up until a few years ago, and I can't remember the name now. But it was on. It was on. There's a very steep. There's only one hill in in Lincoln. It's in Lincoln actually. There's mm. only one hill in Lincoln. And it's very steep, and his shop was halfway up. Is is that not um, the Burkitt shop? 
Could be Birkett. Yes, it could I, be Birkett. I, I think it is, because I went there once a long time ago. And by the way, Graham G8NWC, who commented earlier, says that Birkett is still going, in fact, in Lincoln. Right. So, yeah. Um, yeah. It is, you know, I can certainly remember those days when um, shops were full of surplus electronics and... You were mentioning, I better not go down my own memory lane here, but, um, you know, London with G.W. Smith's and Lasky's and Proops yes. and Henry's Radio yeah. and all those wonderful shops. But yes, 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 you know, I don't yeah. think they'd survive now if they were just selling that sort of surplus things. <laughs> <laughs> so, Peter, look, we've talked about your shop, your, your, you know, Waterston Stanton, very famous brand. And it's and it's lovely to understand how it works now and how it's continuing to, to go. Another slide that you sent us though was spy radio indoor antennas true story so let's see the slide and can you tell us all about this <laughs> he looks a very shady character on the right <laughs> i wouldn't buy a radio from him <laughs> um well basically if you look at the slide on the left hand side there's something called pack of lies uh, i i was i used to belong to a drama group and Pack of Lies is a very moving play about the um, Portsmouth's uh, Portsmouth. I think it's, Port, I think it's the Portsmouth spiring, um, and it featured the Krogers. The Krogers were um, involved were, were involved in sending radio messages back to Moscow via radio, um, and the Krogers um, were spied upon by MI5, and MI5 took over. A house on the opposite side of the road to the Krogers. They were in Middlesex, Rice Lip in Middlesex. Um, and MI5 turned up on the doorstep and they said to the people in this house, We need to um, observe the house across the road. Um, and they said, Okay, well, when are you going to come? And they said, Well, no, it's not Christmas. When we're going to come, we are, we need a room in your house for as long as we need it. So they said, well, you want us to move out? No, no, you mustn't move out because that would alert them. We want to have a room in your house. And we want to observe that bungalow across the road. Well, they were they they, they soon got the picture. Um, the problem was that they were this household were friendly with the Krogers, thinking they were just normal people, um, and they had to maintain that friendship, even though upstairs was MI5 watching every move. And so that was my connection with Spy Radio that that sparked this this uh, thing off. So I, I I did a bit of reading up about the rest of the the, the Spy system. And I wove it into a story, and it was it was just after Christmas or just before Christmas. I wove it into a story, and it was all true. Basically, it was based on the book and so forth. And I did this video, um, really orientating it towards Spy Radio and the fact that they were able to transmit signals using low power equipment with very sort of basic aerials stuck up the chimney or whatever. And uh, it, it got picked up by Hack Day, which is a website I really hadn't heard of. Mm -hmm. And it, it, I, I think at the moment um, it's had 96,000 views, that video. Um, quite wow. extraordinary. Um, <laughs> I think it's, it's been referred to by a lot of people. It's sort of, you know, done the, done the rounds. Um, so that was, that was the reason. I, that was the, the reason I did it was really out of interest, really. And it, it sort of sparked off um, a bit of my sort of former life in drama and the Pack of Lies play that you see there. And so I did this video and, um, well, it, it, it was seen by a lot of people. So, so what does it feel like to be trending on YouTube then, Peter? <laughs> well, actually, um, I suppose because we've been in lockdown for on and off for a year, um, it's filled in the gaps. And we, we, we've, had, we've had a YouTube account for a long time, but nothing much happened about it. And then about a year ago, I thought, well, why don't I really sort of rejuvenate this this youtube channel and i mean i do enjoy talking about amateur radio um and i do know that youtube is is it's it's the go-to channel for a lot of people you want to find out how to put a washer on a tap or and a change a wheel on a renault whatever it is you go onto youtube and there's somebody there's done a video and i thought well for amateur radio there's a, a lot of people want to know how to do this and how to do that so i thought i'd try and cover some some various subjects which are are interesting to me and I hope interesting to, to other people. And it's if you look at the YouTube our YouTube channel, it's not really a selling channel. It's okay, I do cover certain products, but we, I don't sort of stand there and say, you must buy this, you must buy that. I try to sort of inject um, so, some sort of technical um, input into it, particularly for newcomers, because, you know, amateur radio, when, you, when you're when sort of my age, it's very easy to make assumptions. You know, you, 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 talk, you talk about this and that and... and 
you, somebody says, well, what's that? And you think, oh, they don't know what NSWR meter is. Well, of course they don't because they haven't been told. Mm. So, you know, I try to come from it from the point of view what I was like when I was 16 or 17. I, made, I must have made some real goofs. I mean, I did all sorts of things. I, and the number of shocks I got from main shocks was, you know, incredible. I mean, you touch the HT lines and that sort of thing, do all sorts of things. Um, and so I go back to those days and I think, well, you know, the only way to learn is to be told. And I, I, mean, I hope I don't make it overly simple, but I do enjoy doing it because I think it's, you know, it's, I like doing it and I th- people, I hope, like watching it. So mm. that's the reason I do it, really. So, so Peter, <laughs> what is your YouTube channel called? Well, it's, it's, it's not the best of names. It's Water Stanton all run into one word. Um, W-A-T-E-R-S-S-T-A-N-T. Um, that's the bit we got wrong, really. We should have called it something a bit better than that. But anyway, we, we're stuck with it now. So, <laughs> Well, no, that's all right. That was, it's good because I'm sure some people want to go and have a look at this. As you say, you know, especially in this last year where normally clubs, a lot of people would have been taught by clubs and we can show them how to fit up an SWR club, uh, meter and that sort of thing, it just haven't been able to do that. And it's, it's fantastic that the RSGB have managed to keep the hobby going by, by putting all the exams and things online and doing away, at, for the moment at least, with the practical assessments. But as you say, there are lots of holes in knowledge where people have done everything online and then when they come to buy their equipment, they're going to know how to fit it together. What do you, what's your feeling of the amateur radio right now in 2021 as a hobby? Um, well, it's, it's still very lively. I think we're very, we, we are very fortunate that Yesu and ICOM are both headed up by amateurs. And now both those companies um, produce a wide range of commercial equipment. They sell much more co- commercial equipment than they do ham radio equipment. And th- there's always the fear that they might still turn their back on ham radio, which would be an absolute disaster. But because they're both headed up by amateurs, they've stood by the hobby. Uh, Mr. I knew you, and I can't remember the uh, Yesu guy's name now, but they're both headed up amateurs. Kenwood, on the other hand, aren't headed up by amateurs, and I'm not quite sure where Kenwood stand at the moment. Um, so we are very fortunate those two, two suppliers exist. It's certainly um, still a very busy hobby. It's still got a lot of, lot of interest. Um, it is predominantly for older people. I don't know why it is, but it is predominantly for older people. I suppose when I came into amateur radio as a youngster, there was a lot of youngsters because radio was then in its embryo stages. And it's, I, I really sort of compare it with computers. Um, if you go back 20 years, youngsters were keen on computers, building their own computers. But now they're not interested in building the computers. That's gone. They're interested in games, all the games. And I think amateur radio's got the same situation. We were once interested in building radios. Well, it, we've gone beyond that now. We can't really, we can build radios. But really and truly, we start, we, the bulk of the uh, amateur movement is more interested in operating the radios, what they can do with the radios how far they can go, when they can work weak signals. And the only area where there's a lot of building going on really is antennas. Antennas has got a great following because that's the one thing you can do. You can build antennas. Um, But uh, I think radio has sort of mirrored computers. We've gone through the building stage. Now we're getting to the operational stage. Mm, Absolutely. I mean, we're as a club, at least when we normally could meet, we were always trying to inspire people to do construction and things i think it's it's pretty pretty difficult to build radios now that sort of compete with things like the 7300 and 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 radios like that but nevertheless it's really it's quite a challenge but you know you can still build antennas and most people would agree i think the antenna is is the most important part of your shack probably well you certainly don't get very far without one <laughs> that's for sure i've 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 been promoting the end fed halfway over the last two years um mm. because it's one of the uh, easiest antennas to install. It's very tolerant of being bent around the garden. Um, it's multi-band and it doesn't actually cost a lot. And to my mind, it certainly works considerably better um, as a multi-band antenna than the G5RV. Mm. Um, people will argue that point, but uh, I, I think the NFED half wave has certainly become very, very popular. And I, I've done a lot of, uh, well, so I've done about five videos on it now, I think. Yeah, we've got a picture actually of your shack that you sent us. So. Uh, maybe we can share that now, <laughs> Tammy, because th- th- I think that looks to me like maybe that is an ICOM 7300 on the right. Is that, is that right? That's, uh, 
I suppose that is not the sort of shack you would expect me to have. You'd probably expect it to be lo lots and lots of gear. I've never really had lots and lots of gear. Um, on the, on the left-hand side, you've got the IC7300, which is lovely, lovely transceiver. Um, and on the right, you've got the 9700. So the two cover 160 metres up to 23 SEMs. I'm not active on 23 SEMs, but um, uh, yeah, it covers the range. But uh, I've always been... A <laughs> I've been a, a simple ham radio operator, operator really. I, I've only ever once had a tower uh, and a three element Yagi, and that was when I was sort of, you know, in, in my earlier days. Um, but in, in over most of the time, I've just used simple wire antennas, and you can only use one transceiver at a time anyway. That's my station, what you see there. Do you know, I um, think a lot of us, though, who think that, um, well, if I had a company that sold all these radios, it'd be like working in a sweet shop, and, you know, you'd have a different radio every weekend. <laughs> Do you know I get I get I get more enjoyment out of looking at some of the old wartime equipment, um, and it takes me back to the time when I had you know I, I, my first gear was modified wartime equipment, nineteen seven that sort of thing, R eleven fifty five, R one oh seven, R one oh seven weighed a ton, but that was my first receiver. Um, I, I I I'm a sort of a simple sort of guy really. Uh, I wire down the garden and I sit there and if I I, I mean I I was on a couple of days ago and I worked a station in Thailand. It was I, I operate a lot of CW actually. Uh, I love CW and it was the 20 meter band had almost closed and I heard this H HS1 or what it was calling CQ no takers and I came back and we had a QSO. It was marginal. It was only about five and three, but we we had a QSO. Um, I'm not a DX chaser as such. I, I, I just operate as and when I like, and uh, it still fascinates me. You clear, yes, clearly it does fascinate you, and it's interesting to see what you've got there, because you have got a choice of pretty much everything, and that you've chosen the two ICOM transceivers to cover pretty much every band, I guess. Um, yes, that's right. Must yeah, return yeah. to a few comments, by the way, before we um, go too much further. Uh, Noel G8GTZ uh, says, the only exception is amateur television. I think probably it's, that's in respect of construction. Uh, and things like that, and microwaves where most of us still enjoy construction. That's what Noel says. Um, very true. Um, Bob, uh, GS, <coughs> excuse me, Bob GSTU says, is Mark Francis still with the firm? No, no, he left uh, quite a while ago now. Um, I, I, I've, I've lost touch with him. I don't know where he is. He, he was, I believe he was working, he was at one time working up in your direction, but I'm not sure where he is now. Okay. <clears throat> I mean, he was someone, I must admit, who used to come to Norfolk Amateur Radio Club once every couple of years or so and bring some of the latest gear or the latest antennas and things like that. He was clearly passionate about it and was, I can tell you now, although it's probably not much help, but I mean, he was a great ambassador for your company. Yes, yes. Oh, yes, he was. Um, he, he left us all about 10 years ago now. Hmm. Um, I've, I, I, funnily enough, I did bump into because he, he got divorced. I'm not sure whether he remarried, but I bumped into his uh, ex-wife uh, two weeks ago. Um, but um, I forgot to ask where he was, what he was doing. We were talking about his children. But I forgot to ask where Mark was. <laughs> so I don't know. Okay. Um, David Cook says, uh, like your videos, Peter. Many thanks, and share your interest in W in World War Two aircraft. My shack, dining room brackets, he says, has many similar pictures and like you, have a propeller on the wall. Have you found time to fly, he asks. <laughs> um, well, I did. I, I, when, I, when I had my second corneal transplant, um, I uh, passed the medic. I, I wanted to join the RF, actually. I, at six, oh, six, I think 16. I went for a medical because I wanted to join the RF. Um, I was in the air training corps and I was convinced I was going to, fly do something but anyway i failed the medical a uh, big time because i didn't realize i was quite seriously colorblind and they said look you're colorblind there's not much you can do in the rf you're colorblind and i was i, was, I mean i've never had a color test before and he, he said can you read the number on that page and i said no so he turned back a page he said can you see the number on that page i said no and he sort of traced it with his fingers could you see it now and i said no oh, uh, that was my first color test so i failed um but so I, I did. I did take that flying. I um, I did about seven hours solo as a student pilot, and then I had a hemorrhage at the back of one of my eyes, and that was it. End of end of my flying career. Oh dear, but you've still clearly <laughs> At least got I did seven hours solo. <laughs> yeah, but you've still got a passion for it. Clearly, uh, another one of the pictures that you sent us, Peter, and it's still on the sort of icon theme, I guess. But this is that new portable radio, the seven hundred and five. Where does that fit into your life? 
I've always been interested in portable operation, low power operation. I wouldn't call myself a QRP operator, but I've, I've spent a lot of time in Scotland, in, in holidays in Scotland, and I do enjoy portable operation. And um, I've I use the Ellicraft KX2 and KX3 extensively. And then when the IC705 came along, I thought I really must give this a try. And so I got myself an IC705. And in the last few days, we've got hold of the uh, matching antenna tuner. Now that, that's a hot subject because the number of people that said, why didn't they put the ATU inside the IC705? Well, um, I don't know, there's, there's, there's a number of reasons. But basically, um, I'm doing a video on the uh, antenna tuner, which you can see on the left-hand side of that picture there. Um, and I, can, I, I must say, I'm very impressed that antenna tuner matches anything. Um, I've put, I've put uh, five metres of wire on it in the garden, no counterpoise, and it will match all bands one, uh, 80 metres through to 10 metres. Um, it's quite incredible. Um, so anybody that thought, you know, it's it's going to be just an ATU, it's it's got great capability. And I'll do that in a video in the next week or so. Oh, good. But yeah, I, I, I just, I've got the IC705 because I, I, I like messing about with uh, low power. And I guess you said that some people wonder why they didn't build it in. And I must admit, I'm one of those people that, but of course, looking at the size of that, it's probably, you know, it would have made the 705 much bigger, I guess. Well, yeah, I did take, I took the cover off the ATU, hoping to see it, but all I saw was the, the underneath of the circuit board. I couldn't get any further. I wasn't going to take, wasn't going to unsolder things. Um, it certainly um, is, I mean, uh, Ellicraft have proved you can make an ATU small enough because they've got an ATU in the KX2, uh, an optional one, going the KX3. Uh, um, but I've often, I've always leveled the same thing at the FT818. Why at this why, after so many years, um, have Yosu not put an, an ATU in the FT eight one eight? The eight one seven has been, the eight one eight sort of, you know, sort of an eight, an FT um, eight one seven with an extra extra band and a bit another one. What? It can be done. Uh, whether whether I, I don't know really. Um, whether Icom thought you know an, an antenna tuner that small is not gonna is going to be not so efficient. Um, I don't know the answer. I'd love to know what's on the other side of the board. But what I will say is that I doubt if you had an internal ATU in that, it would have the capability of the, the of matching what this, this external one does. I mean, as I say, um, 16 foot of wire, half a quarter wave on um, 20 metres. You can resonate it on 80 metres. And they give a warning about end-fed half-waves. Well, it does match an end-fed half-wave. I've put, a, I put um, 66 foot of wire up, which is a half-wave on 40 metres, and it, it matches it, matches it perfectly, no problem at all. So it's got great capabilities, that ATU. Well, we'll look forward to seeing that, that video uh, very shortly. Um, we've got, one, I think, just one or two other slides left. In fact, one more. Now, we'll, we'll show you this, and you can tell us what this is all about. This is... Uh, a picture of obviously a, quite an old transceiver, maybe. <laughs> it's called a Paraset. Um, I was talking to Chris Danby earlier today, and he knew, he knew the Paraset because actually the RSGB have published a, um, a little booklet about it. But it's not a radio that I knew anything about until the beginning of this year. It was after I did the spy radios, um, including things like the B2 and that. Um, but I, I suddenly heard about the Paraset. Um, Paraset was actually the first um, spy radio used at the outbreak of war. It was, it was a clandestine radio um, issued just after the outbreak of war for um, our um, uh, soldiers operating behind enemy lines. And it's very basic. It's a single valve 6V6 crystal controlled oscillator. That's your transmitter. That gives you four watts. And the two valves on the other side, I think they're SK, uh, 6 SK7 or something like that, which is a super regen um, re, um, uh, detector, oscillator, whatever you like to call it, plus an audio amplifier. So it's a two valve receiver and a single valve transmitter. Um, and the, the, the tuning on the, uh, like a lot of the early equipment, the tuning hasn't got, uh, is not calibrated other than in sort of 0 to 100. You have to have a, a tuning scale that you can see on the back um, of that uh, case there. I, as a result of the video channel, I had a, uh, an email from, I won't, I'm not going to say who it is for, for, for a number of reasons, um, 
this this guy said, Peter, he said, I've been following your channel. I'm going to I'm going to build you a radio um, and send it to you. And he said, I'm going to build you a paraset, um, the uh, replica of the paraset. And I thought, OK, fine. I didn't realize when he said a replica, he meant an absolute replica is he's, he's copying it to every detail. The the chassis layout, the wiring diagram, uh, the metal co the casing, etc., uh, etc. Et um, and I've had I've, we've exchanged emails, and it turns out he does work for a government department, not in the UK actually. He works for a government department uh, in communications. He, he would rather not say, um, you know, put his name to the radio. But he sent me photographs. He's building several of these, and he is a master engineer. I mean, he's, the, the 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 level to which he's gone is quite extraordinary to 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 replicate this. And I'm quite excited that I'm going to get a two valve Regen receiver and, and, a, and a six v six transmitter because my first transmitter was a six v six, which you see there. Interesting thing about this is that it, the the original radio was a bit dangerous. It was obviously, it was, they only built, um, uh, I don't know, three or 400 of them. And there's only 20, I think, survived now. There's one in the um, uh, War Museum, I believe. But it had some deficiencies because it was built down to um, a basic radio using the minimum of components. And one of the most dangerous things was the, the audio output from the anode goes to your metal headphones. And the only thing separating the anode from your metal headphones is a capacitor. So the capacitor comes off the anode and the audio is, goes through that capacitor to your headphones. If that capacitor went mm. short circuit, yeah. you got 300 yeah. volts across your head on a pair of metal headphones. So he is building it with a proper audio transformer inside. And the other thing is that the PA coil is at, HT, is at 300 volts. So if you touch the PA coil, um, you get a 300 volts uh, jolt. And of course, this equipment in those days, it, it couldn't really be battery operated. So there was, a, there was a companion power supply that goes with it, which is building for me. So I hope probably in the next couple of months, I will have this radio. It'll be uh, four watts, crystal controlled on 80 and 40 meters, super regen receiver, and G3O JV will be calling CQ stuck on a frequency of I don't know what. So that's that's the story behind that one. I can I can almost hear and see the video coming now, Pete, because that's going to be one to watch, <laughs> isn't it? I mean that that is going to be wonderful. And apart from making it extremely much more safe, it sounds to me, um, you know, it's, rather than having three hundred volts potential possibly over your head, um, but it sounds a wonderful thing. Maybe you'll send us a picture of it when it's done. Yes, yeah, yeah. I, I certainly, certainly, show you a picture of it. I mean, it's it's quite an interesting thing. It's going back in time, you know. It's, it's going back to my early days of radio. That's how I started the Super Regen receiver and the six V six crystal controlled oscillator. Mm. There we are. It will be lovely. We've just got time now for a moment. I mean, we've, we've been talking over an hour, believe it or not. So, um, what one more question come in now from Julian two E zero DJR? He says, over the years, what's the best antenna wire that you've ever used? Or wire antenna. Well, I, I, yeah, it, the best one I've used has got to be the end fed half wave. I was when I was first licensed, I, I put up a G five RV. I didn't really understand how G five RV works, but it, everybody had G five RVs, and I put up a G five RV. And you know, when I started radio, we didn't have SWR meters. We had neon screwdrivers, and we had um, you know, sort of um, these uh, RF current meters. And all you could do was measure the amount of current going through the antenna. Um, SWR didn't come into it at all. Um, the basic premise was that if you've got the maximum amount of, if you've adjusted everything for the maximum amount of current going into the antenna, that's got to be the best you can hope for. Um, so I used the G5RV um, blindly, really, not fully understanding how it worked. But in recent times, I have to say that the end fed half wave with the 49 to 1 transformer it really knocks spots off of the G5RV. You haven't got a high SWR at all. Um, it's multi-band. Okay, you've got to have the matching um, transformer. But apart from that, it's so simple. You can bend it around the garden and it doesn't seem to worry too much. You still got a decent SWR. It's great. And the number, number of emails I've had from people using it, and they've all been skeptical, well, not all, but a lot of them been skeptical, or oh, it won't work, you know, it causes noise, causes interference, end fed wires, you know. And it's really a myth that's been passed down the, the time. 
Um, yes, the NFED wires probably did cause interference originally because TV operated in the 45 megs and the NFED wire used to come straight into the shack. Well, TVs aren't affected by radio these days. So it's the, the fact that the NFED wire got bad press was not so much because it was a bad area. It was just so close to the TV that it caused interference. You don't get that problem now. So I would say NFED half-wave, I have to say. Modern, uh, modern recent discovery, really, I suppose, in some ways, but it works. Mm. And a part B question, though, is what do you think of the mystery antenna? The mystery antenna? What's, what's the mystery antenna? I don't know. That's what it just says there. Um, so uh, there's a question from um, Julian. If you can explain that, Julian. Uh, Peter's not aware <laughs> of that. A mystery. Actually, there is a mystery antenna. Now, our, our good, uh, I'm sure you know Steve, um, G0KYA, and um, I remember we did use a mystery antenna. So it's, I think it's an antenna, which is a wire antenna, and it's not meant to work if you use all the standard modelling programmes and things like that. I'm desperately trying to remember the call sign that it's used with, but sometimes, but um, unless Julian can come back very quickly on that, I can't really elaborate anymore. But anyway, I'll clearly... Clearly you're, I'll look it up on Google. <laughs> well, yeah, clearly, clearly you're not aware of it, so you've got no comment on that anyway. Peter, it's been a, a wonderful to, to have you here as a guest on NARC Live. Um, we've heard about how you started in radio, how you got into the retail side of the business, why, that big question, why you moved down to Portsmouth. I think we're all much better knowing that. I didn't know all of those details, that's for sure. Um, and just telling us, also about your, as what's very clear is that you still have a great passion for this and that's indeed why you've still carried on in business with it. So Peter, we'd like to thank you ever so much for coming on tonight. We're going to put the links to your videos in our newsletter this weekend and uh, please don't forget to let us see that new or that refurb, well not refurbished, the paraset that someone's going to build for you. We'd love to see the insides of that when you've got it. That would be lovely if you could follow up with that. Okay, well, it's been my, been my pleasure. I'm now going to go on Google and look up the mystery antenna because, you know, there's always something you don't know and I've, it's, it's, it's a fascinating title for an antenna. Yeah, I'll someone, have we have got a couple of comments. I, mean, I don't know if this will mean any more to you though because obviously clearly if you don't know of it, um, Malcolm G3PDH has said that W5GI is the mystery antenna, apparently. Um, several other people are saying the same thing actually, several people. Um, Julian has come back and uh, John and so uh, anyway I'm sure you'll find out about it but if you didn't know about it then you probably hadn't got much thought on it but once again Peter sincerely thank you ever so much for coming on and telling us what the water side of the Waters and Stanton story is it's been lovely to meet you <laughs> okay my pleasure take care take care thank you very much to Peter G3 OJV the Waters in Waters and Stanton thanks very much and that's uh, almost it, really, for NARC Live for this week. We're looking forward to seeing the picture of that paraset, I think, Tammy, in, mm. in a few weeks' time or, yeah. or a few months' time when Peter gets that. Just to remind you again what's happening uh, at the Norfolk Amateur Radio Club next week, we've got the GB2RS News from the RSGB at 7 o'clock on GB3MB on Sunday. On Monday night, we've got the Monday Night Net at half past seven on GB3MB, uh, hosted by Steve G3EVA. And at half past eight, we've got the 80 meter CW net. And this time, next Wednesday, the 7th of April, we've got grounding and bonding, how important they are for your station with Tim Duffy, K3LR, all coming all the way live from the States. And you'll be able to ask him questions as well. Plus all the regulars who shack. And of course, please let us have those stories, pictures, fun things as well to make the program. And that's about it um, from us. So uh, until next week from Tammy M0TC. Goodbye. And from me, David G7RP, take care of yourselves. Have a lovely Easter. Bye-bye.